So nice to see so many folks. I haven't been back in a few months from not teaching this term. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, throughout history, uh, both fields, ecology, have employed shape shift as an important narrative device. Where would be we without the beauty of the East, Zeus and Hera? Even Italo Cavino tells of a prince who is transformed into a canary and one of the princess and the frog. There was even a fleetingly successful shop, an Italian one, called Fiorucci, that got away with displaying a different logo on each article, advert, and storefront. It's a great story. Some of the greatest <coughs> film directors, Kubrick, Ridley Scott, Ang Lee, shift from genre to genre with astounding agility. And as for the lords of fashion, well, sometimes you have to see it. Really. But generally speaking, the world doesn't cotton to architects who fool around. <coughs> Palladio did Palladio. Right did right. Even Goff did cough. <laughs> One guy that fooled around was Sarnan, and of course Sterling seemed to get away with it for a while. But by and large, multiple personality disorder among architects is usually a one-way ticket to obscurity. England, of course, just might be the exception for the celebrated history of eccentrics in Gosford Wild which they've just confirmed with last year's Irish Kapoor Olympics Tower. England may just be the last place on earth where a practice like our speakers might flourish. He is something of a chameleon, you know, juggling Elgin marbles and reviving ideas from pottery stink belt, molding resin and saber-crossing timber, somehow aligning purse along a curvaceous gunnel and somehow maintaining a precarious balance between the work day world and academia. Maybe the fact that he grew up in Switzerland, moved to Ireland, and got his act together in London helps to explain it. I certainly hope he gives us some clues tonight. Please welcome Neil. Back then. Um, I always like to um, collect pictures of architects, and this is one of my favorites. Um, the man in the middle is the architect, on the left and right are his clients. And I love. <laughs> it's, from, it's from a 15th century um, carving in a cathedral at Ulm. What I love is the way his clients are holding the building by their fingertips. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in what this man will be like. He's, he doesn't look like a liberal artist, does he? He doesn't look like the architect of a liberal artist. And would you say he was a visionary? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. He seems, to, he seems to have an extraordinary sense of carrying the building, but not quite being wholly in charge of the building. And um, I like him because I think that he feels, he feels to me more like what it is to be an architect, and certainly in London at the moment, than, 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 I mean, I think he is a visionary. I think that he is a visionary, but his gaze is horizontal, isn't it? It's not, it's not, it's not all the way up. And I think that that's interesting. I think that the sense of him operating in contingency and somehow carrying the project, um, but not being the project, and his relationship with his clients, um, I could look at him for a long time, I think, he, I think he represents to me a huge change um, in the way that architects are seen now. And I don't think it's the first time that we've been like that. We're more enmeshed, we're more compromised, we're more part of something bigger. We don't have all the decisions ourselves. There are more complex questions about authorship. And we, we, require, to, we require to be something for other people in order to do our work. I was thinking the opportunity to make a building entirely in your own terms is something that we wouldn't really consider, at least in, in my corner of the world. The idea of you being an artist who could set out exactly what you're going to do and then do it 
completely in your own terms. The project has to be brought into being um, and to be sustained by other people in order for you to engage in it. Um, and so it's that figure of the architect that I want to talk about a little bit tonight, and th through the work rather than in, in particular. Um, to answer the theory of um, promiscuity, which has been thrown at me a few moments ago, or eclecticism, um, to, answer that, to, 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 to answer that question, um, I thought at an early stage it would be better as an architect to try out being an architect, to try different versions of how you would go about making the world, and then to reflect upon that, rather than to set out my stall early and feel as though I had to be consistent and, uh, to it. And at the moment I'm writing, and um, uh, the book is called Trial Pieces, and the suggestion is that halfway through a 40-year career, I might reflect upon what I've done and the lessons from it, and to see where the consistency lies. And in a sense, to use what writing gives you which architecture can't, which is doubt. To see architecture in terms of it being a doubtful profession, and one where you're constantly asking questions about the terms in which you are able to make pieces of the world. Um, so it's uh, those thoughts that I want to take into the lectures and to show you six projects which we've done. And if you'll forgive me for dwelling a little bit upon ideas, because each one is, in a sense, questioning a set of ideas. Um, the first image here is um, a, a print by Joseph Albers, which I have in my house. And um, I feel that it's got a strongly architectural quality. It's based on work which he did when he was uh, interested in Miso America. Um, and he moved, from, he moved from Europe to America and became very interested in his Mexican trips with his wife. Um, and um, I want to just park that for a moment and say that we begin in our office with something as simple as that and say, could we make a building that, that, that has those properties? Could we make a building that, 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 that owes something to, to that image? And we were given a beautiful site in the west of Ireland, the most westerly point in Europe. And you can see at the bottom of the page the extraordinary rock formations, metamorphic rocks, and a thin valley that lies between two seams of rock um, with a little house that's built in the middle of it. And the strong white line is a stream that flows down through the valley which we've built the house around. Um, and we're held between these sheer rock forms. Our client met us once and gave us a brief which is that our building should be sober. It could cost as much as we liked as long as it wasn't evident that it cost that much and that it should in his terms be a masterpiece. So I promised him two of the three. Um, and the opportunity we have, we had to use an expensive material, but to use it modestly. Uh, we looked at this extraordinary church, St. Finbar's, which is close by in Cork City, and it's made of this solid um, uh, black limestone, which looks grey in the sunlight and goes jet black and mirrored when it rains. And it was such an opportunity to use old-fashioned ashlar that we said that we would take that and use it as part of the project. And this much more ancient church on an island off the coast this building is from the 6th century, it's a little pilgrimage chapel. Um, and both the walls, look at the Cyclopean corner blocks, they're absolutely extraordinary. And the sense you get is that it sits in a field, and that the stones that made it were picked from the field, and that the walls and the roof and everything are made from the same thing. So we, we decided that that had a kind of, we called it an Inca-like quality, a sense, a sense of something that, 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 that knows its own limitations, uh, and that exploits one material and has a fantastic kind of ingot-like solidity. And so we connected that to Albert's own photographs of his um, visits to Mesoamerica um, and the kind of photographs he made, which are so like that image. And we began to think about a building that would be as thick and as dense as those, uh, as those churches um, and would have some of the kind of properties of the, of the, of the, of, of, of the Albert's painting. So the, the key to that on the top left of the image is a secret gutter uh, here. Um, and then the walls and the roof are uh, solid 150 mil stone um, with a reinforced concrete core form and heavily insulated. And the idea was it was something that would be very, very thick walled but would have very thin edges so that we could use the depth of the stone to create thinness. And a model here is showing how these ingots, these sort of blocks of solid stone, um, would be uh, disposed all the same size and all the footprint of the original cottage that stood on the site. So the white building is the cottage. And this model I rotate around a little bit. It is a chimney, and the fire is lit when he drives down from the airport where he arrives in for his, his visits. And so when he arrives down the driveway, he sees the fire lit. And that fire will align with a view of the sea, which is through a window. So that gives you the principal axis of the house. And when you arrive at the house, sorry, I'll just come back. When you arrive at the house, it's just a blank wall with the fire visible. If you look through the window where the fire is, you'll see the surface of the sea. And you go in the door on your left, 
and you find yourself on this axis that makes its way all the way down through the buildings. And it's a very simple game with sheer rock walls on each side of this thin valley. You build a dam across the valley, you bring the stream through to fill a pool, which makes its way through the building and out again. And then the spaces left between the buildings are all, and the rocks, are all little courtyards, which are the main spatial instance as you move down through the building. So arriving into that double height space and making your way through, there's some vertical distortion on this projection, so you have to assume that the building is slightly better proportioned than you're seeing it. Um, and then you can see here the way that the plan is laid out. Um, with, the, with the driveway down this very steep hill to the chimney, the axis which gives you the view down to the sea, and then as you walk down that axis, views to your left and your right, and your left and your right, and you make your way through down until you cross over into his study, which is the end of the journey. And this gives you the sense of the kind of thinness you can get just by mitering back the stone. So the thickness of the stone is expressed as, as an overall band, but then bro brought out to a thin point. And it's so rare in the world that you can make that as a single piece of stone. And we had wonderful Estonian join, uh, uh, masons who did it. And at the ends it's always glazed, and on the face it's always completely solid. Um, and then the interior of the building is the same, with views out left and right from the windows. The client had uh, furnished it with some extraordinary furniture, which I'll thank her for, that's her own thing. Um, but you can see these views that you get through the end of the building, left and right. And that sense of looking out to the fine uh, mitering of the stonework. Um, everything which is filled in the glazing is then just untreated Oroco, which will eventually go a dark grey colour. And we can see at the end that the stream fills this trough which comes down from the valley, the trough fills a pool, the pool then breaks a cleft through the rock and then makes its way down to the sea. So the client moving from his sitting room, which is here, <coughs> has to open a stone doorway, stand on one stepping stone, open another stone doorway and go into his study, which is then aligned to an island with a castle on it a mile across the coast. And then that's the view of the interior of the building coming down to the very end, where you get that sense of the open windows facing east and then looking back into these rock faces at the side. And then that, I'm pleased to say that's the biggest sheet of glass in Ireland. Um, uh, that, 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 that simple view out towards the fastened rock, and you can see on the right-hand side the stream making its way down to the sea. The stone doors going through the cleft in the rock, um, and then the sense that you get when you go through that cleft of the highly reflective property of the stone, that you get reflections of the landscape in that as you go through. And then this is his study, which is, uh, which, as I say, is, 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 is pointing out towards an island on the coast. You get a sense of the overall arrangement there with the, uh, with, with the old stone house and the, the rock face, the, 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 the stream coming down and filling the pool, and the different stone volumes, and that sense of thickness and thinness that you get this pencil-thin edge at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the edge of the ingot. And um, I don't know if it's my view or if this is quite, quite compressed, but all the images are quite vertical, you know, forgive me. Um, but everything is made of stone of different textures. Um, and this is just to take you through the sense of the stream flowing down through these ingots. Um, and the, and the, the, the thinness of the ingots when they, when, when they open out in, into gables. Um, and trying to play this idea of solidity. This is the little tiny gutter you have there which allows everything else to happen. Um, and I felt that to design a building in a country where it's either raining or it's just raining, um, that you needed to find a material that would somehow be transformed and glorified by rain. And you can see what this does here. This is a stone bench which turns into a mirror and the roof reflects the sky. And that sense that you get in a maritime climate like Ireland, where um, you have the wind and the rain and, and the sun, and the sun is always coming out after rain, and you get these kind of immediate transformations. We felt that the very simple stone could somehow deal with those. So to go back to the Albers images that we began with, this was the sketch for the, for the first image, and that kind of ingot-like quality. Um, this is, in a sense, what we've tried to achieve with the architecture, and you can see yourself uh, the places that... Uh, that, 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 that perhaps comes across, that that is a fulfillment of the promise that we made. Um, it interests me in a way that a project like this, with a commission like this, is so rare. It belongs to a kind of Ruskinian ideal that the hands that made it and the place it's in and the stone taken from the ground are, cons are, are consistent. But in a way, it's not a world that architects that I know inhabit very often. It's an extremely rare kind of commission. Um, we've developed a, a reputation for building houses for wealthy people, but in a way, you're making quite limited pieces of the world, and you can make them in these terms. This was about, I don't know if it's comparable, but it's about $15,000 a square meter. Um, so that those kind of build costs are about five times as much as you would, as, 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 as you would, you would spend on a school. Um, so this is another project entirely, and it sort of embodies, um, it embodies the opposite to that ideal. Um, 
an extraordinary commission we were given. This is a wasted industrial site in East London that hadn't been developed for 50 years. Uh, highly polluted, empty as far as the eye could see. Um, and in an extraordinary stroke on one day, it was announced that this would be turned into um, the Olympic site uh, with a new um, facilities, a new park, and a new Olympic village which would be permanently part of the city. And I was really fascinated by this idea of a televisual event, which the Olympics is primarily, which is a kind of, it's a, it's a flickering virtual phenomenon which billions of people watch on television and very few people witness in the flesh. But it gives, it gives itself, it, it makes a piece of city that's there for the next many hundreds of years. So this relationship between the transient, fugitive phenomenon of, of the festival and the permanent piece of building stock that's left behind was something that fascinated me. And the other thing I was really interested in is this, what I call the three-legged race between capital and values that's set up. That the only way you're going to fund something like this in, in, in a democracy like, like London is to get private enterprise to pay for it, because the citizens of London certainly weren't. Um, and so the whole thing is sent out to lend who are the big developers who will develop this project. Um, but because it's the Olympics, it has to stand for values and the best of British. So they put, they, they put, they put a committee in place of the great and the good who will guarantee through legislation and committee rule that value will be held to um, in terms of cultural value. So you get this combination of, of, of growth and economic drive on one side of the equation and of value through committees and legislation on the other side. And this committee of the great and the good put together a framework of uh, 19 architects who would, work on the, who would work on the site. It was master planned and then landscaped and then 19 architects would do individual buildings. But lend -lease weren't having that. They looked at the 19 and said, well, three of them have built for developers before, so we'd use them. So then the values people came back and said, you must use all 19. So lend -lease contacted the three developer-friendly architects and said, will you subcontract the other architects onto your team and employ them yourselves? Um, and what happened was, which is in a way quite pragmatic, is that because the, uh, the buildings are going to be part of the building stock of London for 200 years, there's no point in building it for athletes. So they built building stock which was either market, rentable, or intermediate, which is buy to let. And all of that is regulated by standards which come from developers, estate agents, housing associations, registered social landlords, and so on. And they all have their standards. On top of that, you put the standards of the Olympic Development Authority and the Inter International Olympic Committee. And you had a pile of documentation this thick. And what they said was, well, there's no point in getting 19 architects to digest that. We'll design a chassis, which is a core form for all of these buildings, and we'll get 19 facades by different architects. Um, which I think is both a bad idea, and I think it's also kind of... But it's also true to something that's not as new as we think. I think that sense of the urban realm as a scenography, which is made by the facades of building. After all, the Place des Vosges is like that, and many of the London squares are like that. But in a way, what they did was to build a facade and allow organic development behind it. So the facade stood for sameness, and the development behind it allowed difference to occur. Here we have the exact opposite, which is that the sameness was in the interior of the buildings, and the architects were hysterically competing with each other to produce difference from the same core form. And we, we announced at the beginning of our commission that that was the most interesting part of it. And there was a bit of harumping around the room, but we went ahead and said that's what we were going to do. So the idea of a standardized chassis that somehow gets over a cloud with, with, with cultural signals that represent difference and represent the urban realm, we found fascinating. So we insisted on only designing the facade of the building. And I have a huge interest in this great German writer and architect, Gottfried Semper, and his uh, writing about the origins of monumental architecture. And he says that monumental architecture has its origins in the festival screen, in the scaffold that's erected for festivals, which is then bedecked by emblems, which are cultural emblems, which are representative of the event in some way, or which represents the, 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 the values of that society. And that all monumental architecture is a kind of reification of that. And I found that a fascinating idea. And his notion that the screen of the building, he has his primitive hut, which represents the four elements of architecture. But the screen of the building has an independent phenomenon to enclose space and to, to separate the inside from the outside and, and, and to somehow embed the ideas of that society in it. And so looking to embed ideas for the society that we felt that would be, would be both relevant and critical, we thought that the, the strangest thing about this was a character that I called deracinated, that this place is so uprooted from the, the sheer abstraction of its making, the sense of it being so uprooted from any idea of place, and the speed at which it was being made, and the abstraction of the, of, of the construction process. 
I wanted to find something that somehow embodied that abstraction or that loss that we suffer. And we began with the Parthenon stones because here they are being made under the eaves of a building in a particular light for a cult shrine, for a particular society with its own rituals. And yet look what happened to them. Uh, the idea of these things that were made for one thing but went out around the world. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the depredations of these individual things suffered. Here they are being blown up by Morosini in the 16th century. They were burnt in fires, they were defaced by Christians, they were converted by Muslims, they were, um, they were, they were exploded, they were um, chipped away at. Um, when they were taken by Elgin, the backs were cut off them. Then they were sunk in the bottom of the sea on their way to London. They arrived in the most polluted city of all time on Earth, which was London in the 19th century, um, where they got covered in sulfur dioxide from the coal fires that were burnt in the interior of the room they were being kept in. And all the time they were being re-idealized again and again. And I love this relationship between their physical um, decay and their conceptual kind of reinvention. I thought it was a really interesting thing. And that by being set loose from the building they were in, they were cast and copied all around the world, put on buildings everywhere. So the further they spread, the more the original ones decayed, the more the ideas were reinvented. They became to me truly modern things. And here they are in the Devine Room in the British Museum, presented as kind of artworks. There's nothing about their setting here that relates to what they would have been, or how, how, how they would have been intended to be seen, or what their ceremonial function was. They've become pure kind of abstract entities, copied, recopied, uh, and changed. And I thought it was this kind of homelessness that they have that I thought would be a useful emblem to use for this strange event, which is, which is, which is both something and nothing in terms of the idea of place. And of course, one of the great things that happened in England in the 19th century was that they were copied and, and plastered and, and mechanically reproduced and put on all these amazing buildings by Nash. Cheap, low-quality housing fronted up with these gimcrack facades covered in Greek, Greek sculptures to embody some idea of what the city should be. And it's the paradox that's embedded in that between an idea of quality, an idea of authenticity, and an absolutely ruthless bottom line that Nash experienced and directed in London in the 19th century that I felt was very close to what we were doing. And here they are, there's such beautiful things in, there, in, there, in, in, in the sulfur dioxide on them, the different layers of patination and damage. And then Corbusier, of course, revered them as well. He compared them to the Citroën car and said that in his tailorous way, he said that they're, they're products of perfection in the same way as the industrial machine was. And I love the fact that Corbusier thought that in a tailorized system that the architects would be the masters of that process. But lend lease think differently. They think that architects can be tailorized as well. So six different architects worked on my building. Um, and I, I mean, that might be a bad thing, or it might just be that the way that the world is. But it's very different from Ruskin. It's very different from the house in Goleen. So we had two reference images that we wanted to use. One of them is Warhol. This idea of Warhol taking the iconic image and reproducing it until, it, until you become numb. It, 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 it dissolves the authenticity of the image and the identity of the thing itself. But by doing so, it becomes something else, which is a strange hypnotic character. And Solowitz's variations of incomplete open cubes. The idea of the grid and, as, as, as the, the, the emblem of abstraction, of endless thought, finding no end, but going round and round and round. The sort of hypnotic, almost incantatory quality of both of these images was something that we wanted to do at the building. So by taking something which was associated with place, which had been uprooted and removed, had the sense of being an international iconic thing, but suspending it in a frame and leaving it hanging there was what we wanted to do with these stones. We had a wonderful time. We were locked into the British Museum for a night where we were working with guys from the Slade School of Art in the Bartlett. We digitally photographed in three dimensions the, 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 the Parthenon stones. Uh, and you can see them here. In the middle of the night, the keeper of the stones came down from his room and said to me that we should only do the horses. He persuaded me that the horses were the thing. He said the people of London will love the horses. So we, we moved from some of the more symbolic stones and just scanned the horses. And you can see here the process by projecting onto them and using an SLR to photograph them back to a software program which converts them into a three-dimensional file. We then get these rather beautiful files which we discreetly tweaked in the office so that where you had undercutting on the top of, the, of a carving, you would get exfoliation from frost action if you left it there because they were not intended to be out in the rain. So we subtly weathered the stones in these uh, beautiful sort of di uh, uh, digital files. Um, and then we took them down to Metworks, where they were, um, where they were, where they were, where they were routed out. Um, 
we said at the beginning we wanted to do an entirely digital building that didn't look like an entirely digital building, so you can make your own judgment of it as we go along. But here you can see the uh, soft chemi board um, uh, plugs being, being routed out. And that's a finished routed board. Um, it's amazing on these routes here that this damage was done to the flank of the horse in a fire in 250 BC, and there it is, digitally modelled onto soft board. Um, then it's sent up to another part of England where we made latex casts of it. These casts were, we were able to afford to make five casts altogether, which we were then able to break down into five smaller pieces, so we had 25 modules. Here they are being precast in a factory in Lincolnshire. There was a beautiful morning out up there in the winter time in the Lincolnshire Fens, which is flat, misty, cold country. We came around a bend in the road, and there were 500 horsemen just standing white in the field in the morning with the frost on them. And there they are in the factory being cast in, these, in, 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 in this uh, industrialised system and then taken down, to, taken down to London. And then, I'm very fond of this image because there you have the beam and the column and the infill panel. And they're all one thing being craned onto the building. So the idea of a facade not as telling any kind of truth about the building, but as being an entirely representative screen, seems to me to be clear in this image. And we made a digital decision when we were working on the files in the office that the structure would be zero and that everything which was photographed would be plus, plus on, on zero. So you get this sense of, of the stone coming forward, and it's like the structure is embossed, that you get a depth on it. Um, and uh, it means that in, in the right light that you get the shadow of the sculpture cast onto the stone. And you can see them here being put in with the three-dimensional corner detail being built up. And when we were working with the project managers and quantity surveyors, we said we wanted to give them something like a musical score, which would be a preemptive value engineering of anything they could think of doing to the building. Do you have the word value engineering here? Is it the same? same? So it's usually a battle between the quantity surveyors and the architects, which of course the quantity surveyors relish. So they hated us because we gave them this algorithm, which said however much money you have to save, you do it using this formula, which has got to do with the amount of undercutting, the depth of the relief, the colour of the stone, the number of variations of the panel, and so on. So it was this idea, as the architect, of, of stepping back from all those things that architects care about and turning them into something that are a kind of an offhand process where you say, this has been established by the score in advance, and the project manager, managers can perform it in relation to that score. The other thing we did was to try and produce true randomness on the facade. We found that the closest thing to random we could discover, and we allocated all of the panels to the facade in an entirely random fashion. As long as they were the right size, they were randomly fitted into the, in, into the pegs they were due to fit into. So this is how we set this up, from the original freeze to the five casts of the horsemen, to the way you break down the panels in different ways, and then that gives you the facade of the building. But if you look at the building, you'll try and find composition in it, but there's none there. And you can see that's um, the previous one was the elevation, and here the, the panel's been put into place. Uh, this, I'm afraid, is pixelated. I'm not sure what's wrong with the image. That should be a full elevation of the end of the building. And then that's the finished project with the um, building with the, with, the, with, the, with the stones on it. And what we were looking for was this kind of sculptural quality where the stones would feel as though they had a kind of a ruggedness set into the frame. Um, I'll just move through these images here. The sense of the building... Uh, uh, these kind of horsemen. I mean, what I like about it, I, I hope will happen, is that as it becomes part of the ordinary life of the city, that the horses will kind of disappear, and the bicycles and fridges and everything else that people put on their balconies in London will kind of envelop these buildings. Um, the Greek uh, press wrote an article on their front page, the main Greek newspaper, saying, this architect is in league with Satan. Um, <laughs> this is because the elegant stones are... Um, um, very precious to Greeks. But being a Greek news newspaper, in the first paragraph they went, this architect is in league with Satan. In the second paragraph they went, but on the other hand. And then, <laughs> but on this hand, but on the other hand. Um, so it, be, it became quite a debate in Greece. But of course, we were not interested in, 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 in the... I mean, the Alban marbles for us were, were interesting because they had been lost, not because, not because of anything else. As, 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 as things, I think they found their place in the world as being one of the great emblems of of, of, of uprootedness, and that's why we use them. Another little small project here, which is working directly with communities and working with school children. We worked for four years on a project with children who are between 7 and 11 on a tiny bandstand for a famous building by Eric Mendelssohn. Eric Mendelssohn was a great, um, um, a great uh, expressionist German architect who, who spent a short time in England and built one of his best buildings there. So we felt nervous about putting something beside his building and thought the help of school children would slightly take the heat off us. And we worked through with them, with engineers and so on, with the same group of children. They went from being delightful kids to difficult adolescents while, while we did the project. But it was an, an engagement that became part of the design and education curric curriculum for primary schools. 
And we ran the same process that everybody would do a design. We'd have crits. We'd take good ideas from each crit, and then we'd bring it forward. And we were working with music students and with primary school students all the way through. And what we were doing in the meantime was, uh, these are not digital images, they're photographs we, used in a, we, we took working with a photographer of little models we were making of the bandstand, trying to think about something that's on the seafront and has to deflect the wind, but also has to project sound and make something acoustically perfect. So the idea that a building might be shaped by invisible forces. And also, as the school children came up with an idea that the building might have to move around, and we did these kind of time-lapse images of the model that we made, just taking multiple photographs of the same model, and the idea that the, the, the terrace in front of the Delaware Pavilion is used for tea dances, and we like the idea that the thing itself could be like a dancer that moves around and exists as something that's in time, that sets up different relationships with the buildings. So you get the main building, the bandstand, and the crowd who sit to watch the music or listen to the music, and they make spaces between them. And as a bandstand moves around and the weather changes, then those spaces are different. Now, this is a photograph of the canopy that we made, which is uh, working with the acoustic engineers to get something which, as I say, deflects the wind and projects the sound. And then a tiny step platform um, and the little kind of um, uh, deck which makes it light enough to move. And the key thing was that the weight of the structure is only one-eighth of the wind uplift. So the, 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 the technology involved in getting something that could be moved safely when one gust of wind would turn it upside down was a really interesting part of the project. It was made in three sections in the um, workshop of one of our joiners. And I always remember this image. When I come to the second last project in this presentation, you'll see that image reviving itself as something else. But the way he made this out of plywood, just simple plywood forms with uh, one mil thick plywood put over it and then covered in fiberglass. And then these kind of sculpted forms really come as much from the physics as from any de sort of desire to express uh, architectural form. But Mendelssohn really felt himself that there was a strong connection between music and architecture, that there was some underlying connection between them. And so it seemed suitable to make something where the music formed the building in some way or formed the shape of it. And here's the bandstand in it. We did elaborate consultation with the, with the, the brass band in Bex Hill, who were the local brass band. The pity was that there was a silver band in Bex Hill as well. So the brass band used it like this, but the silver band always come and play beside it. They've never actually played inside it which tells you something about collaboration, the idea that if you convince people that they're part of the design, that somehow when it's made, they will take it on and make something of it. Um, this is a project which um, is unbuilt, but I wanted to show because it's, it's the project I would most like to build. It's a, co a competition scheme on a beautiful park in the north of England. It's a place called Preston, and it's the second very wet place I'm going to show you today. It's the wettest place in England. Um, it's where they um, make, uh, had all the cotton mills in Lancashire and all the linen mills. And this park is an extraordinary um, little corner of American history because it was built by labour, which was relief labour, from the cotton and linen strikers who refused to produce cotton during the American Civil War. So they knew that the Tory government in Britain wanted to be part of the cotton trade. And they refused to be part of the cotton trade because they backed the anti-slavery side in the American Civil War. So many of them were without work for two years and were starving for their principles. And the government of President Preston gave them this as relief work to do. So it's an amazing little piece of history. A uh, beautiful site by the River Ribble. Um, and what we wanted to do is to take this riverside site and the trees and to make something which will remember the linen and cotton workers. It's this extraordinary thing that you get in England all the time, and I know there are versions of it here as well, where you get cities that used to make something and simply don't make it anymore. You go there and the whole industries that used to make this place um, have disappeared, and they're trying to reinvent themselves as something else. I remember Hull, which was one of the great trawler manufacturing, food processing, fishing towns, was trying to rebrand itself as the digital estuary, and my heart just sank when I heard that. I thought the idea of the, the notion of place, which is embedded in human activity, is being lost. I'm not sure what we can do about it, but we wanted to make something that would somehow be to do with, with, with the looms and the mills and so on. You can see the beautiful sense of the site as something that you arrive into the park at the top, and you look down on top of the building, so the roof is the first elevation. And then you come down this wonderful slope. People picnic on this slope, and it gets filled with people. And then you come in under the building and find the river on the far side. So we really wanted to make something that would deal with that. The idea of the picnic cloth laid out on the ground, that you would look down on top of it. And the notion of weaving as an activity, which is both communal, that it embodies communal aspirations in some way. And it has a scale that, I think architecture is very close to weaving. I mean, that's a Semperian idea, but I think that the relationship between weaving and architecture is so strong. And the notion of the architecture of the loom as something that holds the threads, 
and that you could make a building that's almost literally like a loom. And these beautiful buildings in Africa where they, the loom is within the building and the threads are being taken out and held as the weaving is being done. So we were, we, in a sense, we, we loved these images so much we wanted to make something that was quite literally like them. And we found this painting by Gerhard Richter, which we thought would be a lovely roof plan for our building. And we set about trying to make it. So it was done as a competition through a modeling process where we, five of us in the office, just worked for three weeks just weaving this building and designing it as we weaved it and telling ourselves stories about it as we went along. And so it's surrounded by these um, uh, timber structures that, are, that, 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 that take the tensile load. And then these uh, thread cables um, hold up a frame. And you can see it here, the timber frame, making a matrix for the roof. Um, and then that, that, that roof matrix could become something. That we, what we wanted it to do is to delay the rainfall. Um, in summertime, when it rains and you stand under a tree, it's dry. And then as soon as it stops raining, you walk out and it starts to rain under the tree. So um, it's taken that long for the water to come through. And we wanted that sense that we would make a building which makes an extraordinary acoustic when it rains. And where the sense of water being all around you, that you might visit the building on a wet day to see it, um, was something we wanted to do. And that this matrix of threads would hold like a little ecosystem would hold wind turbines and solar panels and so on and be enmeshed with the trees. So the trees growing up through it, um, the gutters uh, taking the water in a very elaborate way out to the edge of the river, um, and then all of the energy for the building being taken by these wind turbines and solar panels which, which sit up on the level of the canopy. And you can see the section of the building here with very simple huts underneath. So it's a park pavilion, there's a little theatre building, an outdoor theatre here which is covered, a little indoor play area, a warden's office, a cafe looking over the river, and some restrooms. Um, and then the path which you saw, the tree-lined avenue, goes straight through the building here, uh, with a building on each side of it. And this gives you a sense of the sort of thing that we made with these simple pavilions. This is the cafe by the edge of the river, with the water spouts all coming out. Um, the plan of the building with the, the, the open communal area, which, with its doors open out into the little theatre space, which is covered. These are the gantries here. The gubbins rooms, the, 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 the um, restrooms and um, the, the, the police office, and then the cafe here. Uh, this gives you a sense of the plan of the building, which is, which is both tree and building and pavilion all at the same time. And here it is at the edge of the water. We wanted, when you sat in the cafe, for the windows to be misted up, and for the, when it rained, for the water to be sluicing down off that, and then sort of just dropping straight into the, into the river. So you'd get that sense of being in a completely watery environment. Uh, and then this is the sense of the, the tree-lined avenue coming straight through the building and the sort of warp and weft of this tree canopy with the roof held above. A different building which we've just finished this week, which is in a very uh, interesting historic setting as well. Um, the 19th century Bishop of Oxford moved all his clergy about seven miles outside the city. And this wonderful set of buildings by G.E. Street, the great arts and crafts architect, made from solid stone. And we won a competition to design a church beside it. This is the elevation of our church here. So it's in the setting of a very significant listed building. When we did the competition interview, we read this poem, and I'll read it to you because it's really architectural. It's very beautiful. It's by Seamus Heaney. The annals say, when the monks of Clonmac Noise were at prayers inside the oratory, a ship appeared above them in the air. The anchor dragged along so deep it hooked itself into the altar rails. And then as a big hull rocked to a standstill, crewmen shin down and grapple down the rope and struggle to release it, but in vain. This man can't bear our life in here and will drown, the abbot said, unless we help him. So they did, and the freed ship sailed, and the man climbed back out of the marvellous as he had known it. What I loved about that is the word that's not used in that poem, but is central to it, is the word nave, which is the word for a ship and the word for the body of a, a, a church. And I love the fact that there's a kind of a hidden sort of depth charge in the poem. And we explored the word nave, and we found that it's also the still center of a wheel, which for a theological college where the seminarians will go out and teach around the world, it seemed to be a very beautiful image as well. And in the competition, we said that we wanted the person who went into the church to have the sense of a kite flyer, with their feet rooted on the ground, but with a sense of being lifted up. And we thought, talked also about airships, the idea of the, this, these, these ships in the air, which was such a strong image in church architecture. Set against that, the notion of a space being made in the ground for a community, the most primitive mark you could make in the ground to represent a community coming together, like a Greek amphitheatre. And so we have the space made in the ground, this little sketch I did at a competition crit, and then this very delicate structure going up into the trees. You can see the GE Street buildings here making two, one side of a quadrangle, and a little nunnery here which has been built at the same time, and the church which is completely surrounded by mature trees. 
This is the biggest beech tree in England. It's as big as a planet. And it sits, the, the church sits just beneath it. And it looks out across a valley here where you can see the green wall of the valley climbing up the far side. And so the idea of the, the place for the community sitting beneath the huge beech tree on the brow of the hill. And the idea of the ship, that, like the ship on the Sea of Galilee, the community sitting together, um, and the, the ship in the air somehow representing the Christian community. And then that there would be a structure which is made, um, which is almost made like a piece of woodland with a clearing in the middle. The idea that coming through the trees to a clearing might be a kind of a metaphor for Christian conversion. And we can see here the position of the building that we chose with the big beech tree and this building here and the view out across the valley. And we looked at some of these other things. This is an amazing church in Venice, St. Stephanus, where the roof is made by the shipbuilders of the Arsenale. So it's called a carinated roof. And the shipbuilders were experimenting with bigger and bigger roof trusses because only under big roof trusses could they make big ships to fight the Turks. So it was this wonderful development of timber roof engineering which was being driven by uh, maritime engineering at the time. Uh, and there's St. Anne's Church in, in Germany, this wonderful um, timber roof structure. Um, what we wanted to do is to think that there would be no stained glass, but this earthwork here, um, a timber structure, and then all the light coming into the building would come through the trees. So that the activity of the, of the light coming through the trees was what would animate the inside of the church. And so we made this earthwork here uh, with a timber structure inside. And the timber structure is unusual in that it holds up the roof, but all the light comes in between the structure and the roof. And this is our carinated roof, carina as a keel. So this is our ship in the air. And it's suspended on this timber structure, which offers the ship up. And then the light comes in and illuminates the underside of the ceiling, and you see it through the timber structure. And as you arrive into the church, you can walk around the perimeter, like those early Christian churches, like the Palatine Chapel. And you walk into the center, and by walking into the center, you rehearse this idea of Christian conversion. And then around the perimeter are these secondary spaces, which are just bolted onto the edge of the building. So here's the keel in the other direction. Uh, we made the building elliptical, so the two points of the ellipse are the low point, and then it just reaches up towards the light in each direction. These were the sketches done for the competition, the sense of the light coming through the trees, casting elliptical patterns onto the screen of the wall. And we worked on this stone bond quite a bit, which is a cut stone piece which is then broken, put into a dog tooth and alternated. And the reason we did that was we wanted this idea of weaving to be taken through again. We wanted this to feel literally like a woven building. And this beautiful plan by Rudolf Schwartz, his church in Frankfurt, Michael's church in Frankfurt, with the ellipse of these wonderful bulbous bits that come off the ellipse. And this sense of looking up through his church. This is how we work in the office with crits. There's nine, uh, a crit, we had nine hands working on this drawing, each drawing versions of the elliptical form of the church. And what I love about these early English churches, the Gothic cathedrals, is the way they just stick things. You have this crystalline form in the middle, and they just shove stuff onto the edge. You get this lovely relationship between these, 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 these pieces that are pushed on and the, and the axial centre. So our plan is rather like that with these bits. This is the place for the Blessed Sacrament. This is the Sister's Prayer Room, the Sacristy, a private prayer space which looks across the valley. And in the centre of the ellipse, we have this wonderful conundrum. The Anglicans, are, they're great compromisers. So the sisters who are very high church, who worship the Eucharist, come in and see the altar from their nunnery. And then the low church people who worship the, the Gospels men from the college and they see the lectern. So the two points of the focus give you a compromise in the form of the church. We made this project in University College Dublin while we were designing it. It's a combination of the design team from my office and some students from UCD. We found out that um, Gothic masons used to draw on the floor, or they draw their stonework jigs on the floor. So we got a builder we knew to, to, to come in and to, to cast a lime plaster floor, uh, just white lime plaster, 50 mil thick laid onto the floor of this room in UCD. You can see the, the doors coming in here, the door here, and the window. And then we came along with a team of people and spent a week just drawing the plan of the building on the floor. And to set up the ellipse manually, bit by bit by bit, over a period of seven days, was a hugely satisfying thing to do. And a chance for the project team to sort of dwell on the project as they were going along. And then this model was made to create a complete digital environment for the church. So the headphones have got an acoustic environment which is computer modeled. And you can then wear this on your head like a kind of a hat and look into the space of the church and hear the acoustic of it. We had great fun with that. That's the, the head of a college and one of the sisters um, being taken through a design team meeting. This is what they would have been looking in at while they listened to the acoustic of the church. <laughs> that's that's that, that valley I talked with, with the green grass coming up the far side and the gap between the trees. Uh, and then there was just one little window that looked out through that gap. So they were getting a sense of the way that the light comes through the trees into the model. 
Um, we had an amazing engineering firm who made this connection, which is a completely invisible connection. It's like um, dentistry, what they did. These tiny steel pieces that sit between the timber, which means that the, the joints are not visible at all. Then this is the jig for all the plywood pieces. And in a sense, we wanted to make this plywood structure as a memory of that bandstand that, that was in the workshop. We wanted to have that spatial quality again. And you can see here the way that the timber structure by itself is freestanding, what Semper would call the tectonic frame, the, the piece that's carpentry, the earthwork, which is the base, uh, the woven stone screen of the wall, and then at the two focal points, the ceramic altar and uh, lectern. So it's a rebuilding of Semper's primitive hut. And above it all, this kind of carousel of clear destroyed light that brings the, the, the light into the interior. No idea. Well, that's, that, that, we'll have to pass on that around. So here's the building just finished last week. It's looking a bit raw, but with a national hour base and the woven stonework and the clear story carousel above. And you can see the quality of the, 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 the tapestry-like quality we wanted to have on this. Um, and the elliptical, the ellipse meant that every single one of these window spacings is different. So they sort of speed up and slow down as they go around the building. And then that gives you a better sense of the... Um, of the kind of tapestry-like quality of the stonework. Once again, we had wonderful masons who kept saying they weren't worried about the, the perpendiculars, they were worried about the spirals, that they wanted them to align. Um, but, uh, but we wanted this kind of deliberately tapestry-like quality. Then en entering into the church, you get the bigger space beyond these smaller spaces. And then coming in, you get the timber structure. And what we're looking at there is the ship in the air, illuminated by the clear story light. Uh, you get the sense of the timber structure holding that up. So the timber structure only touches a stone enclosure at one tiny point, uh, and it takes all of its bracing load from the stone structure. So we have an entirely independent stone enclosure with a sort of a ship in a bottle. Um, and then this gives you a sense of the, of, that's the, that's the point of the ellipse. So everything fans out from there in a radial fashion, bringing light in around the clear story and illuminating the ceiling. And then that's the main space looking up towards the altar. It's, it's an antiphonal form of chapel, so people sit on each side and they pray back and forth, which is what they do in that part of England. The last project I want to mention is just our, our most recent one. I think it's, it's good to show you the last thing we've done. Uh, this is a huge new master plan that's happening in England, in London. King's Cross Station and St Pancras, the two main stations coming into the town, and a big industrial wasteland that was left behind. Uh, they're developing a new square here, which will have a building by Fumiko Maki here and um, another one by Stanton and Williams in the Chipperfield building. So this square will have all these kind of um, cultural institutions around it, and we were involved in a, a project to build a little canopy in the centre. And the thing we were really interested in was those train sheds you get in England. The word phantasmagoric comes from a description of a steam train going through a, 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 sta a station shed. The idea of light, cl cloud, and, and very delicate uh, Victorian structure. And we wanted to make a building that was like a cloud and like a ghost and like a structure at the same time. And so this was the model that we made um, of a kind of a space frame that would be in the shape of a shed but would stand in the middle of the square. And you can see it here as a completely freestanding structure. The largest structural element in the roof is just over an inch, 28 millimetres, and the columns are uh, 60 millimetres, which is just over two inches. So those are the biggest structural uh, members it's got. And it's meant to be something that we felt... On one hand, we wanted to feel as though it was being held down rather than held up. And on, on the other hand, in different conditions of light, it would look somehow ghostly, um, as though it was a ghost of a building. So these are photographs of the model which we made, um, and the sense of it being both a cloud and a structure, and then that's the final image. Thank you. I'd love some questions, actually. So what's the best bit? Has this last project been No, we won the competition two weeks ago. Oh. <laughs> so it is the late. Sorry, I'm <laughs> Other question? What do you think about Herbert Reed? Um, it's a long time since I, Herbert Reed. It's a long time since I've read Herbert Reed, probably fifteen or twenty years. But I enjoyed reading him at the time. I think it was a history of modern art. Um, is there is there something in particular you'd like to ask me about Herbert Reed? Yeah. In, in what sense do you think? That, Work. Um, I 
and if you look at his whole body of work, the elements that he was dealing with, and the influence that he had on modern art, when Clinton Greenberg came and kind of took the mantle from him, and I think what you're doing reminded me of some of the things that uh, he was doing, but then reached to a better level. I think, um, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, to, to address that and perhaps the question of consistency, it seems to me that I don't know why I should be consistent in terms of the kind of buildings that I make, um, because I think that the fundamental underlying problem for architecture, as I see it, is to do with um, uh, the desire that architects have to make buildings which are authentic in a certain set of terms and the impossibility of making buildings under those sets of terms. Um, I was at Peter Zunter's lecture two weeks ago, he won the gold medal, and he has gone about making buildings as Ruskin might have made them. The idea of taking the stones from the ground um, and the, um, the material from close by and the ideas and myths of the people who are near to it and creating a kind of an architecture out of them. But in a way, that's an impossibility for most architects practicing in most developed countries at the moment. And I often think about the person who, I, I would describe the problem in terms of the person who flies Ryanair to Venice. Ryanair is the cheap airline in, in, in I don't know if, they do che if, if, if there are no cheaper airlines in America than Ryanair. It's, 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 it's the zero fare airline. Um, and they submit themselves to this extraordinary process of abstraction to go and worship this place that is the ideal of embodiment, the idea of place. And this relationship between abstraction and deracination, which is the pact that we've all formed in order to send our children to school, have health care, and so on, we submit ourselves to huge levels of abstraction to have that, and yet we have this profound desire for place and for history, for, the, the, for the, that sense of being enmeshed that we associate with older cultures. And to me, that's a kind of a dilemma that can't be resolved, but has to be somehow embodied in architecture. It's not, but I have a problem, which is that the artist who, I, who we refer to explicitly in this is a Japanese artist whose name I can't remember. So. Um, <laughs> and he, and he, uh, he, he, made, he made these fantastically fragile um, space frame structures that have a cloud-like quality. And so, I mean, if I think about the narrative of this project here, it was a competition project, and we went to the site and saw these all the buildings in the background are derelict train sheds, and inside them you have these long runs of very, very fragile cast iron structures from the 1860s held in the light. And I try to fill them with steam again, and to think about this notion of structure being both present and dissolved in the light. And that, that connected into the work of this particular artist. And um, we, 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 began, we began on that. But, um, I think it's consistent with the work that we do in that it's trying to um, deal with an idea of place and with the memory of the, 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 the history of a place, but doing it in a way which is which is not a kind of a literal embodiment of that, but picks up on that idea. Um, I, I think all the time, I think all the time, there's a connection between trying to use some kind of technology, trying to make something which is ethereal or has a particular physical presence but also that, that, that comes from some notion of what that place was or is becoming. And then I look at the work, and it doesn't have any of that feeling. 
it, it, it seems very much tied to uh, contemporary technologies and uh, sense of materiality and fabrication. And I wonder, in your storytelling about the place, whether you think that's something that you see alone in it, or whether you expect people to see this sort of uh, narrative that you're casting around it in in the same terms that you do. I, I, I certainly okay. don't. I mean, hearing your words and seeing your work feel so, um, you know, interestingly contrasted. Um, I mean, that may be one question, but I think I, I would divide it into two in terms of the answers. One has got to do with the specific history of architecture, which is that I was educated by and worked for a practice which was, which the main principles worked for Mies van der Rohe and Hilbert Simer in Chicago. And um, my tutor, Robin Walker, who was a terrific architect, uh, would give lectures on um, Crown Hall and um, um, uh, the Lakeshore Drive buildings. And he would pause on that detail of the Lakeshore Drive buildings where you have the steel column encased in concrete and then re-encased in steel. And he, you could see that it was like some huge betrayal for him. This notion of the truth-telling capacity of architecture. The 20th century idea that architecture primarily expresses properties which are intrinsic to itself. And that, it's, that the, the function of architecture is to express intrinsic truths about the building. And I felt that that had reached a kind of an on pass, and that, um, and that in order to get past that on pass, I didn't see what has happened since then in terms of language games as being relevant to that. But I wanted to go back to the origins of that thinking with, in terms of people like Pugin, um, Butticher, Gottfried Semper, um, Owen Jones, um, and coming up to people like Louis Sullivan who are looking at architecture and looking at the consequences of modernism, but not necessarily in the set of terms that, that tended to turn out in the 20th century. So to go back into the kind of, to, to go back more into the origins of modernism, which I think lie in the 19th century, which was in a way almost a more radical century for architecture than the 20th century, and to try to understand the ideas that those people were wrestling with. And one of the main ideas was the relationship between mechanization and representation. <coughs> How is it that you can, that carving, which Ruskin says that the spirit of the carver and the, and, the, and, the, and the carvings on the building represent the life of the building. But what happens if you make the carvings by machine, or if you can cast them out by machine? And what happened was the decoration got thrown out for that reason. And so the whole capacity, well not for that reason, but that among others, but for the whole capacity for architecture to represent things that are not simply intrinsic, but to represent parables about society, to represent things that we share, has to some extent been lost in its representative function. And the Olympics project is staging that as a kind of dilemma or a paradox. It's not saying it's the answer, but it's saying, look, isn't this tragic? Isn't, isn't, isn't this a loss? And what I would say about that, to return to your second question about ordinary people who are looking at it, how are they going to share those stories? In a way, everybody who goes to Stratford who is not an architect pauses in front of that building and goes, why don't people do that anymore? How, how can you do that? It's a, it's a kind of a shock that people say, how can you do that? Is that not something that people have stopped doing? But in, in a broader sense, I don't think that architects can weave narratives and parables and pieces of poetry into their buildings and then stand around in the corner of their building telling everybody what their building means. I mean, this is a unique situation where I'm talking to architects about how I work and how I evolve my projects. But there's a lovely... Um, statement by, 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 the, um, by, by the writer Borges, where he says, the purpose of art is not to communicate meaning, but to make a space where meaning can be read. And I think that's a different thing. And I think that if you bring meaning into the process of creating something, then it will have some suggestion of the imminence of meaning about it. And then people will find meaning in it. But I don't think it's the purpose of architecture to communicate meaning explicitly. So that's a long answer. I can, I can just say it loudly and you won't need the microphone. Um, the thing that I find so extraordinary about these drawings you've shown us is that they are not only so radically different from each other, but from their immediate context. That here in a very rural, very wild part of Ireland, you have a house of extraordinary precision and sophistication. 
education, the clarity, and there is nothing else anywhere close to that, anywhere around this. And in King's Cross, and you have a pavilion of delicates that's surrounded by one imagines who are very muscular and ponderous buildings and with the two train stations wrapping it. Um, are you, as it were, trying to establish a dialogue where you put the beautiful chapel next to a very serious Victorian building and play off it in a way that makes each one, enhances each one? Yes, I'd, love, I'd like to think I'm doing that. I mean, I think that um, you say that there is no sophisticated and clear and simple stone building near the house that I did, but there is that sixth century church which you could you really couldn't improve upon. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, you know, what, what I was looking, what I would do going to a place is look for the good in it, and I'm not going to try and make an architecture which is which is literally or directly or comparatively like what's near it. But I will go and look around for a long time and try and try and get under the bones of the building culture of that place. In, in some situations, so in situations like um, the west of Ireland and in Oxford and in King's Cross, I was able to find either an, a craft culture or an industrial culture. That that so if I look at the west of Ireland, I can look at the neo-Gothic 19th century churches in, in dark stone <coughs> and use that detailing to make thin edges, and it's a direct lift. And, and, and use that to make architecture. In King's Cross, I can look at the industrial trusses that were fabulous pieces of engineering and, and, and make that lift. And in somewhere like the Olympic site, where there's nothing, you have to try and weave something out of nothing. And that's, <laughs> that's what we did. So there's, there's two parts of the question. When I'm teaching students, um, and we're talking in the office about rep representational techniques, um, what, what I would say is that the first person, when you draw or, or model a building in any medium, the first person you're representing to is yourself. And so you're taking an idea from within yourself and giving it an external manifestation, and that manifestation becomes something very charged in relation to you in the design process. And I would describe any medium that you use, whether it's making a model from plaster, or making a digital model, or drawing. It's in a sense like a window through which you're looking at a building which will be in the world, hopefully sometime. And it shows you something about that building, but it also conceals things about that building from you. And so what you need to do is to enter into a critical relationship with the idea of representation itself while you're designing. Think, what is it that this mode of representation is giving me? And how can I allow, allow that to drive the project forward in a particular direction? But what also is it hiding from me so that I need to turn around and look at it through some other form of representation? And so we very deliberately go through quite long critical conversations in the office and in the teaching studio about why we're representing it to ourselves in this way at this time and how we could use different modes of representation as leverage to help us to bring the project forward. In terms of the consistency of the work of the practice, I don't think that, I mean, I don't believe that we live in a consistent time, and I don't understand why architects would see it as being a virtue that all their buildings are formally like each other. Or, but, but, but I think buildings, the output of a, an individual or an individual office should have some sense of likeness. There should be some theme that, that makes it a critical practice in a way. And the themes that we're interested in are partly to do with process, as I've explained, and how the architect is not the sole author of the building, but is enmeshed in a series of decisions which are not merely theirs. And if you really believe that, then why would your buildings turn out the same? Because they're built in different places for different people at different times. So why would they be alike? But there might be a real consistency in terms of the practice that you're bringing to engagement with consultants, engineers, clients, local people, and so on. There's something consistent about the way that you do that. The most difficult and challenging project we've worked on for the last 10 years is working on dementia projects. I haven't shown them today. But trying to find ways of developing conversations with people who have dementia about what it is to be in space. 
But that level of intersubjectivity comes from working with individual clients and saying that we are the authors of this project together. And how do you make people who can't be the authors of a project participate in the making of that project? So there is consistency in that. And I think there is also consistency in terms of a sceptical but um, poetic attitude which we take to the dilemma that we have at this time about the conditions under which buildings are made. Because, because there is a real problem for architects in terms of the figure of the architect, their authority within the design process, how they earn that authority, and how that authority is used within the design process, and also the, the assumptions that we have, things like structure, truth, place, materials, the user, all of those things are highly questionable um, constructions, which we take for granted. And so there's a consistency about the way that we skeptically address those in individual projects.